Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on limpid touch in the management of scarring, the benefits of negative pressure. And thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us this lunchtime. Now this webinar is going to be split into two sections. We're going to have a 15 minute presentation from Sam Bennett and then a Q&A session where you get to ask Sam some questions about her presentation and the case study. Now, the session is being recorded, uh, which you will get access to, uh, so you can watch it back in your own time. And any questions that you might have, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So any questions, pop them in there and we'll try and get them answered at the end of the presentation. For anyone who is watching on the recording, if you do have any questions, then please feel free to email them into us and we'll try and get them answered as well. So a quick couple of introductions um, for myself. My name is Dominic Smith and I'm a clinical application specialist at PhysiQuip. Uh, for those who don't know about PhysiQuip, we are a medtech distribution company based in the UK. And our aim is to bring some of the most innovative clinically proven technologies from around the world to the UK market to improve the clinical services here in NHS and private practice alike. So with those quick introductions, I want to introduce Sam, who joins us from the Katie Piper Foundation and also Wiston Hospital as well. But I'll hand over to her to introduce herself in a little bit more detail and then kick us off with your presentation. Sam. Well, thank you. OK, so um, I'm Sam Bennett. I work as a advanced burns physiotherapist for Wiston and also um, across at the Katie Piper Foundation. So I'd had a chat with Dom and we were looking at a little bit of a case study for the benefits of negative pressure and my experience with the lymphotouch for scar management. So I'll start with my presentation. So we're going to discuss the patient backgrounds with a specific patient that I've used this with, um, the treatment plan and why I've used the settings and the rationale behind it, and also the clinical effectiveness for the use of lymphotouch for scarring as well. So my case study starts with a 36 year old male. He was involved in an explosion at work where he had significant flame burn injuries. His injuries, as you can see from the diagram, he was approximately 64% mixed depth, predominantly full thickness to his legs and mixed depth was upper limb, back of his head, um, his hands and part of his flank were affected as well. The leg injuries are the ones that I'm going to focus more on um, for the purpose of this presentation. And the injuries were circumferential all the way up from the dorsum of his feet, ankles, up to the buttocks and lower back. So crossing all the joints for both legs. In terms of the management of this gentleman, he had multiple theatre visits and just a bit of a background. So he had Nexabrid, um, which is an enzymatic debridement and also versajet debridement as well. Um, he returned to theatre and had multiple grafts over four episodes. He had split skin graft and meat grafting and his left leg remained a bit of a problem and he had exposed Achilles tendon, which carried on. So as I said, my focus is going to be on his left lower limb for the purpose of this case study. So these are the images of the gentleman, this is two months post injury. So this is his left leg. You can see from the middle image at the top, his Achilles is slightly exposed. That remained for a little while post injury as well. Um, he didn't go back to theatre after this point. He was just conservative management ongoing. There was, you can see from the images, he had multiple areas that were healing really, really well. But some patches, intermittently remained delayed healing and this is really normal what we see in burns injuries um, they use part of the top of the thigh as well for donor sites to help so you can see the injury was quite significant over multiple joints so as part of our assessment i undertook a posas assessment which is a, a score assessment tool that we use this was three months post injury. So this was his next phase of his images that we took. This is a month after the last one. So you can see the colour difference now with the scarring. There's a lot more areas healed. He's still remaining with some open wounds. Um, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is to show you when we started the lymph touch with him, it was reasonably early. And yes, he did have some wounds, but I'll go into 
the other ways of treatment that we can do later on in the presentation. So with this um, assessment, we had the self-assessment score. So we found it seven out of 10 pain. Itching was really high, eight out of 10. The color difference for him was 10 out of 10. The thickness was eight out of 10. So the pictures don't really do the, um, the thickness of the scar injustice. It was really quite taut, especially across the top of the thigh, around the back. Um, and the irregularity, he thought it was 10 out of 10. And then obviously you can see my assessment from the observer scale on the right hand side. Now, to me, obviously this, the scarring is significant, but the main factor is here, his self-assessment is his scarring at the end of the day. And what can we do as therapists to help treat this gentleman? So our, our routine that we used with him was stretches and exercise. And he had a um, two month period where he came in seven days a week, he had the option for a one-to-one -one gym session. Um, it was open for him to attend his own kind of programme. It was altered on a weekly basis. He had therapists there, nursing staff to review. We were very fortunate with what facilities we could offer him. And this was at Wiston. Um, when he was healed, he then went down to the Casey Piper Foundation for the rehabilitation for burn scarring. And he had a four week admission period and we carried on with the implementation that Wiston had already started with pressure garments, positive pressure therapy, um, emollients and silicon we'd already started. We hadn't yet started the intralesional steroid injections at this point. Um, and then we started the negative pressure therapy, which was the lymph of touch at KPF. Now, the benefits of the lymph of touch for him, when we assessed him, he had significant tethering to his scarring and it was specifically around the upper thigh and um, he had a really thick banding. He had significant adhesions which were restricting his range of movement, particularly tightness on um, full hip flexion across the posterior aspect, across his buttock and lower back. Knee flexion was a significant challenge for him and the combined stretch of trying to do like a deep squat combining hip knee and ankle was significantly challenging for him because of the circumferential injuries that he did have. So reduced elasticity, reduced pliability. He was really hypersensitive. Um, he didn't like touching his scarring. He, he found it repulsive. He was really quite distressed by the effects of the injury to him. And he had significant neuropathic pain, so he was really itchy. He had significant pain on standing where he'd get um, nerve pain shooting down his leg and into his feet. And with him being a, a circumferential burn, he, he suffered significantly with edema problems, particularly around the lower foot and ankle. So the combination of the treatments that I mentioned previously, that helped with the treatment of those. However, then we introduced the lymph touch. So we've done the scar assessment, we've done the POSAS, we've looked at the integrity of the scarring, and we've decided on the area of the treatment. So for this purpose of the presentation, I'm looking at his left leg. Um, the treatment aims were to help with his problems that he sustained. So the reduced pliability, the reduced elasticity, the um, sensitivity issues he, he had. So working them together with the other treatments that we've got for um, scar management, we decided that lymph touch would be a good option for him to try. Now, because he is hypersensitive at this point, I could not recommend let's try this setting and say it is a case of speaking to your patient and saying, what are you going to cope with? Every patient is different. You're not going to get one fits all at all. Um, and to, to, like specifically with patients that don't like you touching the scarring, it is a case of building that trust together and working and reassessing the settings. So starting off on a reasonably low setting and then gradually improving it and increasing it and reassessing as you go so not only clinically are you visualizing the scarring and seeing what's happening the, the patient needs to tell you are they coping with it as well um so just that was a nice flow chart of demonstrating so with him we started off with the pressures reasonably and graded very high at the point of where we started this this was um, probably about a month after that last image that I showed you, we got up to the full pressures and he he found that absolutely fine. Um, Visualising the scar, looking at how it 
the cup um, worked with the scoring because it was really thick and the pliability was really reduced. We needed that additional pressure to help with the suction. Um, we did try the intermittent pressure, but the feedback from him, he preferred the continuous because the intermittent, it just was too painful, that constant push and pull um, of, his, of his tissues. He really disliked it, and especially toward the top of his thigh and his inner groin area where the skin was un, unburned. He didn't like that sensation, that pulling. So we preferred the continuous suction. The vibration we did have, and again, we graded, reassessed it and looked at how it was coping and varied it from 50 up to 100, up to 80 hertz. And because it was leg size, we were looking at the 80 millimeter cup. Um, if you wanted to focus more on a specific area of scarring, you could reduce the treatment cup size down. And depending on what the patient's experiencing, what they're feeding back with, if you've got a specific banding that you really want to work on, you don't necessarily need to go for that cup size. You could lower it and work more localised around that area. Um, and the treatment time. So we are fortunate at KPF to have just one to one for five days a week. So with him, I was doing up to an hour and that was specifically for his leg um, and we could kind of rotate it. So we wouldn't do a full day of limb for touch. We would obviously alternate it across the week and focus upon different areas throughout his um, rehabilitation phase. And to help with the glide and the treatment to, to reduce the friction, we used the Dipper base and that was just because he, at the time he was using that regularly. Um, he's now swapped to a Vino and he, he just found that more comfortable to use. You, you can, but in terms of the comfort levels, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the friction and the discomfort that the patient's going to feel is just not, it's not worth it because with the scarring, you've lost the hydration and the oil. You're having to give them that level of moisturiser back to be comfortable to use the treatment cup and head. So with those settings, you are constantly looking and observing how the scarring is responding. And with the negative pressure, the suction cup, you know, when we look at um, scar massage, for example, we look at blanching and the, the pressure that we're applying. And that's how we observe um, for scar treatment that we are applying a suitable amount of pressure. It did occur for the negative pressure suction so you could see significant blanching around the area um you know you have to just keep looking at it obviously some areas are going to be more supple than other parts of the scar and so you've just got to work your way through and adjust the settings as um as required so any adverse effects so excessive pain um, any sort of areas of fragility with the skin or looks like there's possible that you shouldn't be having these settings on that area then you've got to adjust the settings, reassess, and then if it's completely just not working, then obviously you'd stop your treatment as you would with any other um, any other treatment that you'd be providing for a patient. So for him specifically, the contraindications and cautions, um, there was some element of unstable scarring that we avoided. He did still have the chronic wounds, um, particularly around his left Achilles, and he did have patches there was just no way that we were going to be applying emollient or the treatment cups to those areas. Um, the risk of infection was high with him. However, we took the appropriate infection control precautions, making sure that you're cleaning the area, that the treatment cups are clean, that you're changing the, the, um, the foam heads, that's what I'm speaking for. The, I can't think what they're called, the little reusable filaments, the foam can't think about the cause. The, uh, the filters. Yeah. 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 So changing the, the filters um, as well, even across from um, limb to limb, we were changing the filter cups for him because he was such a high TBSA and we were spending such an amount of treatment time. The filters are only small, so we were swapping them between each um, limb. A fragile epidermis as well. You know, he was a reasonably new heel burn so we were very very cautious as to where we were treating him and assessing observing the scarring and his response to it 
any excessive pain and discomfort, we, we changed or altered the treatment. So as I said, we started off on the intermittent um, treatments and then we went to the continuous pressure because he found that more comfortable. He liked the higher vibration settings because it helped with his nerve pain and his itching. And obviously, as I mentioned, the exposed tendon to the back of his Achilles. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we cannot treat those areas. It means that we need to think laterally and think how we're going to treat them separately. So we wouldn't necessarily go across his tendon. It's an exposed tendon. We'd go around it adjacent to it. So we worked a lot on his feet, um, gliding and working up towards his thigh to help with lymphatic drainage. Um, and while he was doing this as well, getting his limbs moving, which was really important. So he had daily treatment sessions for four weeks, Monday to Friday. So this was at KPF. And then following that, he was transferred back under Whiston and he had weekly sessions for up to an hour for two months ongoing. And that was mainly focused to his legs and his hands. As I said previously, the caution areas or the areas that are completely contraindicated, we would treat adjacently. So his Achilles would treat around it. We wouldn't go anywhere near the wounds. Anywhere where it's a fragile scar, we'd, we'd move away from that area completely. But it doesn't mean that you completely have to stop the treatment. Um, and I've commented about the static and dynamic use, which I think is a really important part of this treatment. Um, with him, when we first started the treatments and he was first healing, his range of movement was sitting between 20 to 40 degree knee flexion. His main goal was to be able to do a deep squat. And with the area of his injury and his TBSA, the challenges for him to regain full range of movement were quite high. We actually used the limpa touch as part of the force. Um, we do passive force to flexion. And um, he does this that as well. So we do hit a knee full range of movement into flexion. And we do the limpa touch treatment whilst moving um, or static in like a force. Hips externally rotated in kind of like a seated frog position, and we do so the sparring was already on full tension, and then we do the treatments, and we found that after the feedback was that he he felt easy to move, um, in terms of range of movement. Now, as a combination treatment, he has actually got full range of movement of every joint of his legs. Um, eight months post injury. He, his self-assessment was considerably lower. It's not zero. We wouldn't expect that with the size of his scarring, but it's significantly less. You've got more than 50% improvement in his outcome measures. Um, and these are the images. So the top left one is approximately eight to nine months post, um, post injury. And the two lower ones are this week <laughs> so that would be a good oh gosh I'm trying to think now nearly a year and a half post-injury so he has obviously been out of the system because he's, he's not been having active treatment while we've been on lockdown um, but from the first image his scarring compared to the very very first heel picture has significantly improved the vascularity the softness he's got full range of movement so his main goal was the function aspect of it and then he was thinking then I'll work on the aesthetics approach but the lymph touch will help with both of them as you can see from the the images and the patient outcomes that we achieved with him so the initial observations that I found were because we were using the dipper base and we were really focusing on the tissues he did have immediate improved hydration um, yes, because we were using high settings, he had localised erythema. However, it's not a prolonged. It's not a prolonged problem. It is just because you're really working on the tissues. Um, it didn't cause any ongoing issues, and he had improvement in elasticity and flexibility, especially with the stretches combined with the treatment. You found that the outcomes were immediate. The, the ongoing outcomes of improvement were he reported um, a reduction in itch, reduction in hypersensitivity, and improvement in skin pliability and elasticity, and as I said, an improvement in range of movement. So to conclude, the lymphotouch is 
a really good complementary treatment for scar management. It's used in adjacent and it's part of like your toolbox. You use it all together and it works really, really well. Um, I found it. There is anecdotal evidence of improvement in pruritus and pliability. The patient reports it. That is the main important thing for myself as a clinician. Um, it has been observed to support lymphatic drainage with the with this patient in particular. Um, as I said, a combination of static and dynamic limb positioning, it does help. So whereas you typically are doing combined passive stretches and then you're separating and doing your um, scar massage, you can use the treatments together, which helps with time efficiency as well. Um, it's a non-invasive, ideally pain-free treatment. Oops, sorry. And the feedback from the patient is really positive. Every person that's had this, they want that, they want the equipment, they want to do it again. Um, so I found really good benefits from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. That was really interesting. It's nice to see um, it actually showing such a good effect with, with a particular patient. So thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. So um, we're now just going to move to our Q and A session. So if you do have any questions, you have a look at the bottom of the screen. There is a question and answer function. Um, don't be shy. Any question is a good question. Um, so please uh, pop anything in there. I just want to sort of kick off, Sam. Um, so you mentioned that you started quite early with limpid touch, like within a few months of the injury. Yeah. Um, what was your process to coming to that decision and, and not just with that patient, but also with other patients? How do you decide when is the right time to apply negative pressure treatment in terms of lymphotouch? So it's knowing the patient and the scar. So it's assessing, having a look at it, how robust is the scarring? If, if for example, his scarring was repeatedly breaking down, there was ongoing issues with regards to um, fragile scarring and ongoing healing problems then I wouldn't be doing any forcible sort of um negative pressure with him I think you get to a point where you can start with the hands-on with the positive pressure with the scar massage compression garments then you know you're getting towards a stage where the scarring is as robust as it can be at that time to start with alternative treatments and I think onto that Janine Evans has, has asked um have you used it early with any other patients Yes, so we're quite lucky in that we've got um, the step through with the referral system with the KPF. We're getting more and more patients at the moment um, in the subacute element. Obviously, all that's virtual at the moment. Um, but in terms of at Whiston, yeah, we've had patients that have still been in the acute setting um, and we've had it on um, backs, for example, to help with severe itching we've used it in combination with the dermacool to help um with that with the high vibration settings not necessarily a high um a high um pressure setting but definitely the vibration to try and help settle the the itching that patients are getting early stages i see bit that vibration is coming quite nice and like sort of override those sensitivities and just putting more i guess it's just putting more input in isn't it and just trying yeah. to override it yeah yeah. Good. And, and on the topic of um, when to start, Alison Guy has just messaged um, asking, do you use the cap refill as an assessment tool of when to start? Um, yeah, so we will fully assess the scarring. So we'll look at um, the, as I said, going through the pose observer scale. There are other assessments that we do, so it's not specifically just the pose ass. Um, so we'll do hands on, we'll ensure that, um, this, and knowing the background of the patient as well, so making sure, as I said, that there's no ongoing chronic wound issues that are recurrently breaking down. Um, definitely. So it's a full assessment of the skin area before you start any treatment, especially early days. I suppose that's the key thing, isn't it? It's like that assessment. And yeah. I suppose, you know, it's it's experience as well. And the more you use it, the more comfortable you get. Because I suppose when it comes to not only when to start to use the device, is that you mentioned you started on quite a high pressure setting. So 180 to 250. Um, right, we always advise you start at 80 because it's just a good baseline. That's what the system defaults at. Um, but how do you, I mean, 
you go from 180 there like how did you and the same not only with this patient but with other patients how do you know what pressures to start at and does that just is that again just link back to the assessment and your experience yeah so the thickness of the scarring is a big determinant of that so for example the one that in reference to the itch is the acute inpatient his scarring was very flat it was very soft um there was a the capillary refill for example was fine um, he was quite pink and red, red um, in vascularity, whereas in comparison to this case study, he was very purple. His scarring was very thick. It was rope in tethered scarring. You couldn't pick it up, for example. You, there was no movement in it at all. So the, the two, um, with the first one, with the acute one, you, you'd start off with the very basic settings with the other one, the case study, obviously I have started it off on the 80 and then gradually graduated it up. But his comfortable treatment setting was the ones that I'd said on the on the slides, yeah. which was significantly higher. But that reflected the extent of his scarring and the thickness and the, the reduced pliability in his scarring. Yeah. And I suppose that is that patient feedback a real big indicator of what, you know, it's obviously affirming or, or confirming or what you're doing. And you're taking that patient feedback. Is there ever a time when you're the patient saying that's not enough? Yeah. And you're like, actually, no, I feel that this is enough. So this is what you're having. Do you have, do you have moments like that? Yeah. And obviously you as the clinician have to take charge of your treatment. So, you, you know, patients will say, right, just do that bit, go a bit longer there and turn that setting up. And they'll, they'll think that the maximum setting at the maximum vibration is the best effective treatment for them. And we know as clinicians, it, you, it's not. <laughs> it just depends on the scarring and how the skin is reacting, definitely. And the other sort of past medical history, you know, if you've got somebody with diabetes, for example, and, you know, they've got peripheral, peripheral neuropathy, you're not necessarily going to go and crack really high settings up on somebody's limbs because the sensation might not be the same as another area or another person you've got yeah. to treat that that person as an individual definitely i absolutely agree and i, I think as well i mean alison guy just asked another question about um about the treatment aspect and it's kind of ties in with how do we know it's precious to use and which treatments to use is it are you ever worried that you might cause an increase in fibroblast activity if you start too early and i also as well is if you use the wrong pressures, you ever nervous about causing any more damage or any more irritation? Like how do you process that? So when you're observing the scar and you're looking at how the skin is reacting to it. So as I said earlier, you wouldn't be increasing the settings on unstable scarring. I wouldn't be going over that treatment. So with that gentleman, I was aware of him from the healing process straight through. So I know how his scarring was responded. Um, we went very, very steady. Um, the, the, the settings that you're seeing on that treatment was probably the optimum as to what we achieved. And he was with us every day and we were able to observe and reassess on a daily basis. So if there was any point of where I felt his scarring was deteriorating between me and the other clinicians, we would be changing our treatment to, um, to help to stop oh, any deterioration. Yeah, and with the fibroblast activity, like, you know, I suppose that's kind of linked to, like, hypertrophic scars and creating too much scar tissue. Is that, you know, is that, is that a point of, point of sort of thinking? But also, does it help with, you know, if you're in, you talked about your dynamic and your static treatments, does that help with, obviously, the flexibility and ensuring that we don't have hypertrophic scars? Like, what are your thoughts about potentially increasing fibroblast activity and, and that kind of thing? We, I mean, in terms of the scar management at, from an early stage, we, it's so important to, you know, we, we encourage to get pressure on from as soon as the healed and in some cases just healed um, to help with compression. Definitely. In terms of the negative pressure, in, used in a combination with the other treatment sensibly, the the rate of fibroblast activity for this patient specifically it didn't increase it his scarring is significantly better um with the combination of treatment 
obviously this is specific about the limb for touch but we were using a lot of all the factors of treatment with him specifically he didn't have unstable scarring we were in a position to continue with the treatment and it didn't irritate his, his scarring it didn't increase any fibroblast activity um I, there is always the risk with unstable scarring or um you know keloid scarring to help to increase it or deteriorate it but that again is to do with your assessment as a clinician or your scar assessment tools and monitoring it regularly and you i mean you mentioned then about it being a com like sort of a combination treatment using it sensibly with other things and that's obviously a point that you know some people look at a device and it's not just lymph it's just medical technology sometimes in isolation of just yeah. what that actually bring to the table I think, uh, would you be say it's fair to say that you've got to look at it as actually how does it fit into my entire treatment offering? You know, it's a terrible phrase. I'm sorry, but it's a terrible, but it's a cliche phrase, isn't it? More tools in the toolbox. Um, but have you got to look at it in terms of like how it how it works in that whole pathway of care, really? Yeah, it's not going to be appropriate for every patient. Um, and it's not going to be appropriate at the same time of healing either for every patient, as I said, it's got to be scar dependent and patient dependent, and you've got to take into account the other past medical history and other factors like chronic infection. You know, it's got to be utilized as, as a toolbox, basically. You've got so many different skills as a therapist um, that we're fortunate that we have this as an additional tool to use if, if we choose to use it with the patient. And I think just to sort of wrap up that in terms of like the actual treatment application of things, Caroline Kendrick has asked, um, so we talked about when do you start using lymph and touch and what pressures do you start with? But what stage of the rehabilitation pathway would you think about stopping or you know ceasing use of, of lymph and touch and negative pressure therapy? So with the scarring um, for this case study specifically, he's not had it now for... Probably, well, since last March, he's not had it, unfortunately, but that's been due to, to lockdown situations. We would have continued with it up to the two-year phase for the maturation process. If he'd have had any um, sort of reconstructive surgery, then we would have looked at restarting that treatment again for him specifically. So there's no set, I will cut off this treatment at that time. It is a case of how the scar is responding um, and if they've had any other procedures in the meantime. That's so again, because it comes back down to the assessments, you're following them, you're tracking them, right? What are your aims, goals? What does the patient want to achieve? If I say the patient wants to achieve that range of movement aspects of that, you know, influenced your treatment um, intervention to include the dynamic movements, to include the dynamic movement stuff as, as well. So, um, I think that's where it comes back to, isn't it? It's just like your clinical assessments, reassessing and, and using what what you feel is, is, is the right. Yeah, I mean, scarring will plateau as well. So you find that we'll get to a point where it just won't, there's no change in it, no matter what treatments we throw at it. Yeah. That will just plateau and that's the nature of, of, um, of scarring. So, yeah. you know, I wouldn't be continuing treatment if it wasn't showing any benefits to the patient. Um, I, I, as I spoke to you before, Dom, it's not necessarily just utilised in the setting as a scar treatment. You know, you can use it as an MSK tool as well. So in terms of the patients for helping them with the range of movement, for example, we will use that in that setting for the rehab side of things. You know, you're getting patients pushing them to the limits. They're not just going to have scar, scar pain. <laughs> They're going to have other discomforts. I suppose, actually, but you mentioned obviously it's being used in the MSK, the musculoskeletal aspects as well. And Joanne Wright has asked, um, can it be used with surgical wounds? So I'm presuming it's like, you know, um, orthopedic surgeries, reconstructive surgeries, that kind of thing. Have you got any experience with that? So does she mean in terms of like um, the negative pressure, like back therapy? Because no. Yeah, I just think I think maybe just using like lymph and touch following surgery. So obviously, I know you're dealing a lot with, with burns. If you have, have you had any sort of you know experience with those? Whether it's, I'm, I'm presuming that it's elective surgery, reconstructive surgeries, that kind of thing. We have used it for a reconstructive surgery, so more like linear scarring. Um, but in terms of if it was for negative pressure for wound therapy, 
no, you're looking at more when we can collect the exudate with the vac therapy sort of equipment, not this product. It's not. Yeah. Um, but if you were looking at helping with um, lymphatic drainage, you could treat around it. The same again as what we were talking about with the other wounds um, with this patient in reference. Um, you don't treat obviously over the direct wound. You wouldn't want, want to put the treatment cup over it. It's not that, that sort of treatment for it. Yeah. And to add on to that, actually, the surgical stuff, like I, I work a lot in orthopedics. Um, so I've treated ACL reconstructions, those kinds of things. And we've seen some really nice results. And we've been treating them within like three weeks, four weeks, um, increasing range of motion, just processing the edema. Um, and you mentioned wound care, like it is used in wound care, but I'd say not on the wound, around it. And it's just clearing up the lymphatics and, and processing mm -hmm. the lymphatic system, getting that going and allowing the body essentially to do what it does and, and heal. Um, so yeah, it can be used in a lot of, I think really it boils down to if the lymphatic system is involved or the fascial system or structure is involved, then you could probably justify utilizing lymph and touch negative pressure in some way, shape or form. But again, it comes back to your assessments and what the goals and, and outcomes are. Yeah. Um, just from a technical standpoint, Sam, so Ali Hunter has just asked, do you find the vibration more beneficial for scarring than um, just the negative pressure? on its own? For the patients that I've treated, all of them have wanted the vibration setting on um, right. specifically for the scarring. So it depends on the area that you're treating. So for this case study in particular, with our focus with this size, the, 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 the epidermis is a lot thicker. So in comparison to another patient, for example, that we treated who was neck fresh to the thorax and rib cage, they wanted the vibration, but on a very, very low setting um, because the, the fascia was completely adhered to the rib cage and they found it too hypersensitive to have a high level of vibration on. So we're saying, again, you, you've got to look at where the scarring is, the PBSA, and the thickness of it to then make your um, judgment as to where your treatment settings are going to sit at. Yeah. Nice. I hope that answers your question, Ali. Um, I just want to move on to, obviously, we talked about a little bit about the dynamic aspect of your treatment. So for those who you know, aren't aware, it's actually just getting the patient moving during treatment, whether it's passive or active. Now, at KPF, you're quite fortunate that obviously you can see patients for a, a, a decent period of time. But you've also got um, the Primus um, yeah. that you work with. And I know I've been in contact with patients who've been referred to the KPF from different NHS services around the UK. I've had Primus. Like, how has... For those who don't know what it is um, and don't know how that's sort of been utilised, like what is it, how have you utilised it and um, yeah, on, on what kind of things have you done with that? So the Primus is, um, we're, we're very fortunate, as you said, to have um, the access to that at the centre as well. Um, it's a large piece of equipment with lots of different attachments and tools. So how we use it at the centre is um, we do initial assessment objective measures with it so we've got a set um, number of tools that we use the same to standardize at the beginning of the stay and at the end of the stay so we've got comparative measures to look at strength um, and muscle power of how the patient progressed in the four week stay with us I know places use it in a lot of ergonomic settings so they all put different bits of equipment on it to help with return to work or um, treatment for physical things like I don't know, climbing a ladder, for example, you can put settings on it or pulling a rope, um, doing a screwdriver, that sort of thing, driving a car. There's loads of different attachments that you can do with it. We use it throughout the day in the centre as part of our treatment tool. So we do the outcome measures for the beginning and the end where we've got um, a specific set criteria. But we use it, for example, we'll do rowing on it or... We'll do leg press, as I said. We do fishing on it for somebody that was specifically interested. Fishing, fishing where you kind of a patient's hobby was um, a specific focus on fishing, and he wanted he didn't think he had the upper body strength to do it. So we increased the resistance, and we were doing like the casting, and then increasing the resistance as we went through the treatments throughout the weeks. Yeah, um, yeah. and you, the patient can see on the graphs as well their results. So it's very competitive that movement but then you're getting the, the data in terms of what he can do physically yeah and how much more range of movement because they're not necessarily focusing on 
the, the auxiliary scoring or the elbow scoring at that point um, to thinking, I want to get back to this year. <laughs> so we've got the visual cues with the, the screen where you can get the data um, yeah. back and you can utilise that for patient documentation to show that they're improving. So it doesn't necessarily need to be just bend and straighten your elbow. You can make it really fun and unique to that patient. That's quite cool. I've never actually heard about it being used to fishing before. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, it's, I, that's, I think it's quite interesting. You know, I think if people um, have patients that go to KPF, I think it's probably important to know Primus, Lymph Touch as well, and just how things, you know, those those things work. Um, so we've been quite fortunate to work with you um, on both of those bits of kit now for, for some time. And um, I just want to sort of wrap up that with one of the last things about, about Lymph Touch. Um, so you've now been using it for oh, 18 months. Um, I, Probably know. just over. Just over now. Yeah. Um, time flies, eh? Um, so one of the things that we've, we've got people on this session who already have the device and have probably been using it just as much as well and might have new staff coming in. But also I recognise some names on here that um, have never used the system before. Um, how long did it take you to just be comfortable with using the system? And for those people who have those little bits of uncertainties, like what's your advice to them to, so they can become comfortable with using, using the technology? I'd say do CPD in-house if you're really unsure on how to use the equipment, get familiar with it. So practice on your peers first of all, to see what settings for normal skin and how, and put it on yourself and see what it feels like. You know your patients that come through. I mean, I mean as I said, in Burns, we're very fortunate that we know the patients for a long period of time and they, you get to know them and what they can cope with. If you have got somebody that you can trust in terms of a patient um, that will give you honest feedback, go with that as well. Yeah. Um, that's also a good a good idea but definitely you know it's just trial and error you know if you're unsure in terms of going over somewhere you're going to irritate the scar don't necessarily go straight over the area treat around it speak to the patient start off on really low settings just gradually build up to what you think the patient's going to be comfortable with and what they they feel it's comfortable with I'd say the handling is the most important thing I think if you're not confident with it um and you hold it statically for prolonged periods of time you will get um suction marks you just need to just be um confident with it and comfortable don't be afraid to use it yeah I think that's that's it. it's like the hardest part is probably using it on your first patient um, where you say get that guinea pig get that person who's like yeah treat me it's fine um and they yeah. can you know, use it from that perspective uh, like i say we're always here so if you're using the device myself if i don't know the answer then obviously sam i might speak to you and say oh, you know can you can you help me with this but no i think it's I mean, the thing to, to sort of add on to that is it's a very safe or would you agree it's very safe it's a manual therapy system so you're not putting anything into the patient there's no electrical current there's no laser anything like that it's manual so it's very very safe there's very little that can go wrong um if if anything like you say it might just be a suction mark um or a patient just says that's a bit too much would you agree that's probably about yeah about, yeah yeah oh, perfect so, yeah so i think what we'll do is we'll, we'll wrap things up there unless there's, there's anything else you'd like to add sam no thank you very much perfect so um, thank you everybody for joining um, tonight. Oh, today even. Sorry, I almost said tonight. Um, Sam, if you could just drop onto the next slide for me, please. If that's okay. So, um, but Sam, yeah, thank you very much for joining us, sharing your expertise, sharing that case study as well. I really, really enjoyed chatting with you and, and learning about your experiences. So following this session, you will receive a survey along with the link to this webinar recording. So you can watch it back in your own time. If you do have any other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today or will pop up later, please feel free to reach out and we'll get them answered for you. Um, we will be sending out a survey. If you could just take two minutes um, to share any feedback or any suggestions for future webinars, that would be greatly appreciated. If you're watching the recording, again, if you want to send your feedback, that would be fantastic. Um, in terms of our upcoming webinars, we do have one on negative pressure and introduction to clinical applications, uh, which is on the 29th of Jan, so tomorrow. Um, we also have another one coming up in March, 
which is on lymphatics, um, particularly around cosmetics and plastics. So that might be quite an interesting one for some people as well that we can keep you informed with. Otherwise, Sam, thank you so much um, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for those who joined us and watching the recording and have a good day and everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. See you. Bye. Bye.